Hello and welcome to Missouri Legislative Update. This month we bring you our program from the historic Senate Lounge, located on the third floor of the Missouri State Capitol. On this month's show, we will highlight several legislative proposals moving through the General Assembly. I'm Jonathan Lorenz reporting for the Missouri House of Representatives. And reporting for the Missouri Senate, I'm Jennifer Yapel. More than 300 projects across the Show Me State could see a facelift with the passage of legislation that would authorize revenue bonds to fund updates on state buildings across our state. Tight budgets passed by the General Assembly over the last few years prevented necessary maintenance on buildings located on higher education campuses, as well as those that perform important functions of state government. Now lawmakers have a chance to address deferred maintenance on these buildings, including the construction of a new facility to replace the Fulton State Hospital. Senate Bill 723, sponsored by Senator Mike Parson of Bolivar, would raise the cap on the amount of revenue bonds that may be issued and limit the use of these funds for renovation of more than 300 existing buildings throughout our state. There's still, even with 200 million, there's probably another 600 four to six hundred million out there that we still got to figure out how to do as, as time approaches but not as critical as what's this in this bill so i've tried to do it uh, as fundamentally conservative as i can to make sure the money was going to needs uh, within the district as the chairman of the senate interim committee on capital improvement assessment and planning Senator David Pierce of Warrensburg describes how committee members toured different facilities across Missouri last summer to see how many of these state buildings were holding up after years of deferred maintenance. Literally, the state of Missouri has thousands of buildings out there, and we are the landlords. We're the keepers. And for the short time that we're senators, then I feel that we have some responsibility to make sure that we maintain those. Senate Concurrent Resolution 39, which outlines these 300-plus projects as a companion measure to Senate Bill 723 and pledges the state to make future appropriations to repay the full cost of these revenue bonds. However, Senator John Lamping of Ladue disagrees with this approach and instead calls for reallocating money now in the state budget for these projects. What's pragmatic and what is Problem solving in nature is what we're about to do, which is when we can't make the hard choices every year as we're writing budgets, we can't make the hard choice this year, which is to spend with the money we have, a pragmatic solution is to go raise the debt ceiling, borrow more money, and then spend it. And, and I think we have an opportunity to lead the way uh, to do something I feel like we're obligated to do when we sit in the state center. Senate Bill 723 and its corresponding concurrent resolution are now in the House for its consideration. The Missouri House of Representatives approved a proposed ballot initiative to help fund the state's transportation needs. In this month's top story out of the Missouri House, we take a look at why supporters feel the tax increase is vital to help improve the state's infrastructure. Trucks. The Missouri House put its stamp of approval on a proposal aiming to increase transportation funding in the state. House Joint Resolution 68 raises the state sales tax by one cent. The penny increase could generate more than $800 million in new spending for the state's roads and bridges. Send it to the vote of the people, let them decide, overwhelmingly support uh, for this issue because the people all across the state realize we have a transportation infrastructure need. No matter if you think it's for roads, bridges, or any other type of multimodal transportation. The money generated from the increase would go directly towards transportation needs and not be subject to the legislative process. The tax proposal includes a 10 year sunset provision, requiring voters to renew the one cent increase every 10 years. However, not everyone supports the funding increase. Some feel the state needs to reevaluate its priorities before asking for a tax increase. We need to prioritize the money that we already have uh, and uh, utilize the money for what our true uh, government roles are versus uh, trying to ask for more money and still invest money into uh, to programs that are not as necessary. Lawmakers approved the resolution with more than 95 yes votes and sent it to the Senate for discussion. If the Missouri Senate also passes the resolution, it still must be approved by the voters before becoming law. The Missouri House of Representatives sent legislation to the Missouri Senate 
aiming to give the state a greater say when it comes to what is taught in the classroom. Through the legislation, lawmakers look to tailor the state's education standards to what is appropriate for all Missourians. And I probably, I could not get... The Missouri House put its stamp of approval on legislation aiming to replace a new set of federal education standards. House Bill 1490 seeks to set up a process to replace the Common Core education standards with ones more suited for the state. Developed in 2009, the Common Core is a set of academic standards for math and language arts. The proposal doesn't eliminate the Common Core standards. It gives the state an avenue to develop new academic standards better suited for the state. And so what we want to do is when we uh, move forward with Missouri standards, we have Missouri residents, Missouri parents, Missouri teachers being able to express their concerns and their ideas to help make sure that our Missouri standards are the best possible. The legislation creates two 14-member working groups to develop the new K-12 through grade education standards. It also gives school districts the ability to generate its own academic standards as long as it is in compliance with the new state standards. Currently, several school districts across the state use the Common Core standards. And it's possible, although, although probably um, not likely, that, the, the, that these study groups would keep the Common Core and simply improve on the implementation of them. So I think that's a possibility that we will still keep the Common Core. Lawmakers passed the proposal with more than 130 yes votes and sent it to the Missouri Senate for discussion. In a display of bipartisan support, lawmakers recently gave their final approval to legislation designed to streamline Missouri statutes regarding crimes and punishments. Senate Communications Correspondent Brad Bashore details Senate Bill 491. For the sole purpose of restructuring the Missouri Criminal Code. After Dixon, years of work and compromise by lawmakers and the legal community, the General Assembly recently passed legislation designed to restructure Missouri's criminal code, a task that has not been undertaken since the late 1970s. Senate Bill 491, co-sponsored by Senate Minority Floor Leader Joe Lee Justice of Kansas City and Senate Judiciary Committee Chairman Bob Dixon of Springfield, would, among other provisions, streamline existing criminal statutes, create new classes of felonies and misdemeanors, and ensure that crimes count toward repeat offenders' enhanced sentences. We are doing this because we need to make sure that we are not just tough on crime in this state. We need to make sure that we are smart on crime in this state. And the one of the things that we have found is that when you send someone to the Department of Corrections, their chance of reoffending once they get out increases exponentially. A clear, concise, and understandable criminal code provides judges, prosecutors, and public defenders with the tools they need to deal effectively with violent offenders. Initially, the Senate and the House proposed two separate bills. The two chambers would later reach a compromise on several issues, including fines for first-time offenders regarding the possession of marijuana. Former prosecutor and Senate Judiciary Committee member Senator Kurt Schaefer of Columbia says the rewrite of the criminal code could have been broken into sections in an effort to make sure there were no mistakes. Public safety is the most important thing the state of Missouri does, and the impact on victims and victims' families if something does not go right is terrible. And my only concern is, is by doing the project of the entire criminal code at one time, I simply believe it was too much to do at one time, and it's inevitable that something may have been missed. If approved, provisions found in Senate Bill 491 would not take effect until January 1st, 2017. This would give lawmakers two years to make any necessary changes to the bill before it becomes law. Additionally, um, we have the Supreme Court now who has engaged and said that their Missouri um, Criminal Procedure Instructions Committee is going to review this and help us bet it, bet it so that if they find any problems, we can correct it in the next two legislative cycles. The measure now heads to the governor's desk for his consideration. Reporting for the Missouri Senate, I'm Brad Bashore. Up next on Missouri Legislative Update, veteran Capitol reporter Bob Pretty sits down with Senate Minority Floor Leader Julie Justice to talk more about updating our state's criminal code before the bill passed by both chambers and was sent to the governor for his signature. Stay tuned.
Welcome to Capital Dialogue. I'm Bob Pretty from the Missouri Net. We're going to be talking about the criminal code in this segment with Jolie Justice, a state senator who's been pushing the criminal code bill now for three legislative sessions. And before that, a lot of people were doing a lot of work for a long time. You're finally seeing the light at the end of the tunnel on this, aren't you? I feel like we are. It's been a long process. The Missouri Bar, of course, started five years before we even started on it uh, with a group of criminal law practitioners working on a consensus document. And so it is good to know now that um, we've had a third read in both chambers, and uh, now we're going to send the bills over to the other chamber and see if we can work out the differences. Does it make any difference really which bill is the one that actually becomes the vehicle toward final passage? It makes no difference to me whether it's the House bill or the Senate bill. Obviously it's the substance of the bill that's important to me and so uh, we'll kind of iron out those details as we move forward. Now as, as we record these, these segments with you and later Stanley Cox from the House, uh, you're still negotiating how this is going to work. What are the main big differences that you have to work out? Sure, there's two main differences right now, and the first one has to do with the size. Um, we, in an effort to respond to the governor's concerns that the bill was too big, um, decided to strip out about 400 pages of language that was just reassigning letters to new felonies. Uh, the House did not do that. The second issue is more substantive in nature. It has to do with the penalties relating to drug crimes, and we have been meeting with the prosecutors, Representative Cox, myself, and trying to come up with um, a compromise that I think will maintain the spirit of the original bill that was sent to us from the Missouri Bar. Well, sketch for me what the differences are in drug crime. Sure, difference. right now um, any of the changes in penalties for drug crimes were removed by the House's version of the bill. The two biggest issues are number one when it comes to felony possession we have reduced the penalty for felony possession from one to seven years to one to four years. The House did not maintain those changes. The second piece has to do with first-time marijuana possession. Uh, the original version that came to us from the bar reduced that to a class D misdemeanor which means there'd be no jail time associated with it just a fine. It's still a crime, it's still a misdemeanor, it, count towards, it counts towards your record if you're going to be a prior and persistent offender but that first time you know you will not be faced with jail time. The reason that that was important is number one that's how prosecutors were already dealing with these cases and then number two it really helps the public defender system because if you are not facing jail time the state does not have to provide you a public defender and so it helps those resources as well. And the public defender has been complaining for years that they're overloaded, Absolutely. largely because they have to do a lot of work on these things that have fairly minor jail time involved. Absolutely. And so one of the things we're looking at is anywhere you can find a place to safely remove jail time, it really helps the public defender system. And it reflects, frankly, how these cases are already being handled already. But doesn't the Senate position uh, invite criticism that you're going soft on crime? You know, anything that you do with crime has the possibility of doing that. Um, the balance with this is that we are getting very tough on crime when it comes to violent offenders and persistent offenders. The reason that this consensus document was delivered to the legislature in the first place is because the prosecutors and the public defenders found areas to have the give and take. So for instance, um, there is a new assault category that the public defenders don't like in this bill. It is actually going to increase jail time for violent offenders. I think that if you look at the bill as a whole and not just on the crime, on the drug piece, you'll see that we are going to have bad people stay in prison longer and then the mix of folks that are in prison will be focused on violent offenders and not nonviolent offenders. Does this place a bigger load though on the probation and parole people? I'm not sure that it pl pl places a bigger role. I mean, we have been looking at how we can get the right mix of people in prison for a long time. Um, I think that this in particular is going to be on the front end with the sentencing as opposed to the issue on the back end with the probation and parole. One way you shorten the bill is by leaving out a lot of gun reference yes. uh, laws. T tell me why you did that. So as most folks are aware that have been following the legislature, there are a lot of issues relating to weapons that are, um, a lot of le legislation relating to weapons that are in flux this year. And so uh, we decided rather than um, pass something in the criminal code that would then be, um, I guess, you know, messed up because of something else we pass in the legislature, we are going to just remove those and then deal with those at a later date. And plus, I guess, probably another reason is that the argument over gun issues in the legislature could 
delay the bill itself. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, one of the things that has been incredibly controversial in this building is how we treat um, weapons and weapons offenses and then also the concealed carry administrative um, issues. And so we decided rather than having any of that controversy and rather than trying to deal with a, um, a area of legislation that's in flux, we're just going to go ahead and leave it out. Now, I've heard some voices in the Senate express some frustration, and I think probably you to some degree, about the governor's insistence that this be a smaller bill because apparently he can't read it or his staff doesn't want to read a bigger bill. Is that a, is that a major hurdle to you? I think at one point it was a major hurdle because I heard from leadership in the House and the Senate that they weren't willing to let us move forward if the governor was just declaring this bill dead on arrival. So what we did is we, we did two things. First of all, we responded by making the Senate bill a smaller bill. And then second, we got together with leadership in both of the House and the Senate and all of the folks who have been working on this bill and we counted the people and we basically went to the governor and said, we've got the votes to get this through. Um, it can't be done in chunks. It has to be done as one cohesive piece and uh, we would like your help on this. I think at that point he sat down and started listening to us and, and the, he obviously is still expressing reservations. There's no question about it. But now at least he's talking in terms of we're going to vet it, we're going to make sure that it's good before we sign it. It doesn't go into effect for two years. That's right. Why? Um, that was to address some of the concerns that folks had that there might be something in there that we've missed. Um, it doesn't matter if it's a one-page bill or if it's a 700 or 1200 page bill there's always um, a need to fix something it seems and so what we decided to do was leave a two-year window that also allows for all of the training that will be necessary from law enforcement through all of the criminal law practitioners in the courts to get everything that they need to help implement it. And, and then if we do need to make a legislative fix, we'll have two years to do it. Now, you're a lawyer. Is this bill, if it passes and becomes law, are lawyers going to have to learn a whole new set of standards? Are you, re, are you changing any precedents that guide the law? Um, there will, you, you'll have to learn, some things will have to be relearned, there's no question. And, and I've talked and I've been excited to be able to talk to some of the folks who um, went through this in the 70s when the new criminal code was enacted in, in 1979. Um, frankly, there are no new crimes in it. There is no decriminalization of anything. Uh, they will have to learn some of the penalties that are associated with the crimes so that they can make sure they're making the best decisions on the front end. Okay, the last question for you, talking about penalties. You don't do anything with, about the death penalty, although nothing. a lot of people want to repeal it. Absolutely. There's nothing in this bill about the death penalty, and frankly, there's nothing in this bill relating to sentencing. It's all um, regarding, at the front end, the penalties that are associated. And the judges still have flexibility within the parameters to sentence however they want. Absolutely. Absolutely. After the break, Bob Pretty sits down with the House's lead lawmaker on the criminal code revision to get the other side of the story. That's up next on Missouri Legislative Update. This, this allows two legislative sessions. There are a million places you'd never consider texting. So why would you do it while driving? Leave risky driving to the professionals. Stop the texts, and together we can stop the wrecks. The House bill is somewhat different from the Senate bill that we just talked to Senator Jolie Justice about a few minutes ago, so we're going to review that and see where we're going to go. Your bill is longer than the Senate bill. What, uh, what did you leave in it that they took out, or what do you have in it that they didn't put in? Well, I'm certainly more familiar with my bill than theirs, but as I understand it, um, in an attempt to uh, accommodate uh, the governor's concern and his expressed concerns about it, they took uh, the entire chapter uh, concerning weapons, uh, but most importantly, they took out uh, the references creating the fifth class of felony, and, and that just by the nature of, of the beast were just lots of words. And so uh, there's really substantive very little difference between the two versions, even though uh, almost 400 pages difference. How, how critical is that fifth class of felony as far as the House is concerned? Well, I certainly think it's important. Um, the, co the committee that did this work, the Bar Committee, and uh, believed that uh, a, a mid-range of punishment was, was important, and I think they made a really compelling argument in regard to that. 
the, uh, the Senate draft, as I understand, just simply takes the reference to the new class. The, the mid-range felony is still there. Uh, it's just not called a new class. So it's, I, I don't think there's particularly beneficial to do that. We'll see how that works out. What do you think is going to be the biggest hang-up in the House of Representatives when you come in with ultimately a compromised version mm -hmm. come out of conference committee? Is there going to be an issue that could hang up this bill in the House? I doubt it. Um, I think that, uh, that obviously things change as uh, there were a significant different vote in the House as it was a, a year ago when we passed it out. But uh, uh, you know, I think that you have to be sensitive to the concerns of the, of the representatives. I mean, we're asking them to vote on a 700 or 1,000 page bill. Uh, you have to, A, convince them uh, that that has been carefully vetted and, uh, and explain any changes when it comes over from another house, uh, from the other, uh, the other house. Uh, but I think there is a, a lot of, uh, part of it is outside of the house. There's a lot of, uh, uh, people who want it to be passed, and so I think it's very helpful to do that. And I think if we do a good job of explaining the differences, I think they're willing to, to deal with those. This is an eight-year process. It started with the bar mm -hmm. committees doing mm -hmm. some work for about five years before it came into the legislature. Right. After all of this, do you have any fears that there's something amiss in any of this legislation? Uh, nothing significant. Uh, there, uh, I, I think that uh, I had the good fortune uh, several years ago to participate in several of the meetings of this committee, and, and I was impressed uh, uh, by their intellect and their hard work and, and their work ethic in regard to putting this together. Now, is there, are there some issues with the code? I, I think there unquestionably will be things that will have to be fixed. Uh, if we cut out the fifth uh, class of felony, I think they'll probably come back in a couple years and probably fix that. But uh, are there other things? Uh, I, I think that we've done a good job of, of, of making those uh, only minor things. Uh, and I think there is enough time. Uh, the House bill has passed. The effective date gives us a couple legislative sessions to, to look at it and to study it. And, uh, and, and uh, so I feel comfortable moving forward. Do we really need to do this? I mean, we got criminal laws on the books. Right, right. Well, see, what happens is that uh, uh, in 79, when they passed this criminal code, the idea was to have some orderly system of writing laws so everyone can understand it. Uh, they can understand the elements of it, the, the mental state, uh, all of the factual basis to it. And, and over a period of time, quite frankly, the General Assembly uh, every year passes two or three or five or ten uh, new criminal laws. And or they redo the existing criminal laws, most of them are redoing. Uh, and and the and there and the the cohesiveness of the code vaporizes after a period of time. So so we have a code in name, but we don't have a really a, a code in the sense of what I, as a lawyer, think of a code. A code is a cohesive document where you where you can understand it and and figure it out. The same sort of language is used throughout, and that's what this restores to it to the original. So I, I think it's a worthwhile. Uh, is it, is it uh, the most important thing in the world? No, but uh, I think it's worthwhile. How have you written it so that it's not going to need to go through this process again in another 30 years or so? Uh, I think it will in another 30 years. I won't be around to worry about that. But, uh, but uh, you can't stop the, the legislature from, from uh, revising. And uh, uh, I, I would think that at least for a time, people will be more careful, especially when there is a clear pattern established the way the, the words are put on paper and and it it might discourage the uh, the creative uh, rewriting of criminal laws but it it will eventually happen it's just human nature it's a legislative process I would have to look at my calendar but I don't think 35 years ago we had much of a public defender system for example as has the growth of the public defender system been influential in the need to do something about our criminal code well, we did have we did have pay for in '79. We did pay for the defense of people charged with serious offenses. Um, I think I think the, the the need is not necessarily the public defender system. I think the public defender system and its growth is a product of society as a whole. And uh, you know, we have more crime. Uh, I think maybe there's an argument made that we have more laws that we shouldn't necessarily have. That's not really dealt with by this code, but. 
uh, but the, the uh, complexity of it, I think, is, is, is what drives this. Uh, and to have, a, to have a rewrite of the code to make it understandable, not only to practitioners, but to regular people, seems like a great benefit. When we talked to Senator Justice a few minutes ago, she was talking about some changes in the drug laws that are proposed in the bills mm -hmm. and, and, and how a different approach is being taken on some of those things. And I asked her if this leaves any opening for people who might say that this new system is kind of soft on some crimes. Mm -hmm. I think, fundamentally, uh, I disagree with making controversial changes, including drug laws, changes in the drug laws that uh, are, are controversial in such a massive undertaking. I think as a matter of public policy, you, you should, you should uh, what we should do here in the legislature is, is deal with uh, legislation, changes of public policy in a way that the public can understand what we're doing and to hold us accountable. Uh, I, I think that uh, to, to make a substantial change in the way that we treat drug laws in a thousand page bill is wrong. And I think that if, if it's good public policy to change these sorts of things, we should do them in separate bills, an up and down vote wherever every citizen can say, you did the right thing or you did the wrong thing. Uh, and so that's my resistance to it. I'm not really uh, big on, on uh, making drug laws uh, less uh, important or making uh, the punishment less on drug laws. Personally, that's not my uh, history, and uh, I'm a former prosecutor years ago, and I, I think the drug problem is a serious problem, despite what current, uh, what we read on the news at night. I, I think that is a serious issue, uh, marijuana included. I think that, that especially its effect on young children, I think it's serious. Uh, I just don't think that should be made in a complex piece of legislation where the, uh, where the representatives and senators are not held accountable. Last question for you. The differences between the House and the Senate are size and a few other details. Does it really make any difference whether it's the House version or the Senate version that becomes the final vehicle that goes to the It government? does not to me. It does not to me. I, I think it's worthwhile to do it. I'll work to pass uh, some legislation and uh, what it, if, whether it has my name on it. Uh, I've done the same work on it, whether it's the Senate bill or House bill. It doesn't really particularly matter to me. So the legislature, by the time they, re they, they adjourn, hopes to have a new system of the criminal laws in the state of Missouri ready to go to the governor. We have a few weeks left as we record this program to see what the final shape is. We'll be reporting on the final result in a few weeks. Thanks. And that's our show for this month. If you have any questions regarding anything going on in the Missouri House, you can visit our website at house.mo.gov. I'm Jonathan Lorenz reporting for the Missouri House of Representatives. And if you have any questions about the legislation that appeared in this program, please visit our website at senate.mo.gov. We leave you with video of the Senate's memorial service that took place this month honoring the dedicated service of 60 former members of the upper chamber. One step forward, march, right, face, forward, march. Across the In a few minutes, the names of these 60 former senators will be called in one final roll call in this chamber for them. And for a brief second, for a brief second, when someone answers present on their behalf, they will live again in this place. It will be up to each of those who respond on their behalf to decide if they are only remembering them or if they are memorializing them.